Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to another Aero South Africa webinar in conjunction with Safety First Aviator. This will be our first webinar for this year, and the feedback we've received about our previous webinars has really been positive. And it's so encouraging to all of our speakers who really do put a lot of effort in, they share their insights and their knowledge in the hope that you will be all safer and more cautious before takeoff. The webinar tonight will be addressing pre-flight pilot safety, planning for the next hour. My name is Neil Piper, the head of content for Messi Frankfurt, South Africa, and I'll be hosting the webinar to now, tonight. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Anneli Reynolds, Anneli is the Portfolio Director of Messi Frankfurt, South Africa, and the Show Director of Aero South Africa to welcome you. Anneli, good to see you and over to you. Thanks, Neil. It's good to see you tonight as well. And everybody that's um, going to be presenting tonight, excited about tonight's topic. And Ari, that will tell us more about what the topic is all about. As Neil mentioned, I am Anneli Reynolds and I am the show director of Aero South Africa. And I must admit, I'm honored to be the show director of Aero South Africa. And I will tell you um, about that in, uh, in a moment. I'm extremely excited to confirm that Aero South Africa will be taking place this year at Vonnerboom National Airport in Tswane from 7 to 9 July. We've been inundated with requests to exhibit at the second edition of the event, and we have a number of industry leaders who have confirmed their participation. And this is the reason why I am so humbled to be part of this amazing growing event. We have our first batch of exhibitors confirmed, and I'm going to go through them with you quick. It's Bose. Bell Helicopters for the first time at Aero, Concorde Battery, Airbus Southern Africa, also a first time exhibitor, Pulis, Spider Tracks, Afghan Jet, Wings and Things, DJA Aviation, Aviation Direct together with SA Weather Service, Aeronautical, Blue Chip Flight School, Sling Aircraft, and another new one, Exam Revolution. This sets the scene for an event which will showcase state-of-the-art technology, the latest developments in the, general in, this, uh, sorry, in the general aviation industry, creating a platform where exhibitors and visitors can once again conduct business face-to-face, -face, which I'm certain everybody is giving a sigh of relief. Um, and this business that you'll conduct will be either to start a new working relationship or to nurture an existing one. The event will be compliant with COVID regulations. And as, our sa as your safety is our first priority, we will ensure that all these regulations are adhered to. Aero South Africa will also offer visitors to the event a choice between driving or flying. Demo flights will also be allowed, so aircraft manufacturers and distributors have the opportunity of giving a prospective buyer a first-hand experience, which will surely speed up the decision-making step in the purchase process. There are still stand space available, and should you wish to book a stand at this event, um, for your general aviation-related products and services, kindly contact me. I'll pop all my details into the chat box and my details are also accessible from the Aero South Africa website at www.aerosouthafrica.com. That's www.aerosouthafrica.com. And now before I talk way too much about this event, I'm handing back to Neil to kickstart tonight's session. Anneli, thank you so much. Now you can relax. Um, but um, I must just say, you know, when you talk about being live again and in person, um, it really, really is amazing to have that opportunity to engage with people face to face. Uh, we hosted one of our first events last week in Cape Town. 
And I've got to say, people are desperate for that interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction. And it was really cool. And then just touching on the safety aspect that you mentioned, this is what we pride ourselves on. So don't be afraid. We will take care of you. All protocols will be adhered to. And I can't believe that there's still stand space available. But um, I think everybody watching tonight, if you haven't booked, you need to do so quickly because uh, you don't want to, you, you want to avoid any disappointment of not being part of Aero South Africa this year. It's going to be yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you, Anneli. And Thanks, now, Nick. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it really is my, my pleasure to welcome our speakers for tonight. We'll start with Ari Levine from Mayday SA. And Ari is still enjoying his 31st year of general aviation flying. He holds a fixed wing CPL IR and a BSc and MSc in electrical engineering and numerous IT security certification. He's passionate about aviation safety and has been a member of the Mayday SA team since 2018. Ari, with all of those qualifications, you're making us look very, very bad tonight, but um, great to have you here again tonight. Thank you very much. Next up, we've got Caroline Cole from the Essential Pilot. And Caroline is a qualified commercial pilot, flight instructor, ground instructor, author, aviation blogger, and general hangar snoop. Really? <laughs> I need to see that, Caroline. She holds a BA Honours in Political Science and International Relations and came to aviation later in life. Um, she's had a very, very successful career as a professional athlete in the sport of triathlon, where she held multiple national titles and represented South Africa at the elite level. The passion and discipline have translated into a lab for general aviation and the development of female participation in the aviation sector. She's a firm believer that proper planning, self-discipline, all lead to safe flying experiences. As a war warbird fanatic, she dreams of flying inverted in her own machine. One day, Caroline, it's coming. And then last, but definitely not least, we've got Lauren Smith from Weather South Africa. Lauren is a meteorologist based in the Cape Town Weather Office. She's got a big passion towards aviation and weather forecasting, and she's been part of the campaign for five years now, and is truly honored to be part of such a positive team. I've got to say, it's wonderful to have you all on again, and um, we do appreciate the efforts that you guys take in, in just keeping, keeping our aviators safe. And then to our delegates, um, thank you. Um, for joining us tonight. And then can I ask um, all questions that you've got, if you can just pose them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address them towards the end of the webinar. Um, please note that we will address um, all the questions towards the end of the, 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 um, the session tonight. And if we don't get to all the questions, we will try to ask, answer those questions post the event. And we'll also be sending you guys a recording of the event tonight. So those are our esteemed speakers. And first up is Ari. Um, great to have you again, Ari, and over to you. Thanks, Neil. Before I start the formal presentation, um, I'd just like to say a few words about the theme that the team has selected. We've gone with, for this year, the theme of the next hour after Richard Collins's book by the same title. And the idea behind it is really that the most important hour in your logbook is the next one that you fly. Because up until this point, everything has gone well enough that you are here to watch, listen, and participate. So it's the next one that actually requires all of the focus. And it also gives us an opportunity to discuss all sorts of topics that maybe aren't quite as conventional as, as we have addressed in the past. Nonetheless, we still have our usual presentations and I'm going to start off with the pre-flight yourself. And as usual, the first slide is a little bit about Mayday. Mayday 
is an organization devoted to aviators in a crisis and assisting them however possible. And we deal with all aviation license holders, so ATCs, pilots, cabin crew, and their families, and everybody that works on an airport, basically. And we help with everything from incident response to medical issues, to post-accident debrief and defusing. We can assist with substance abuse problems, license issues, and really any crisis that aviators may be experiencing. If you need to talk to somebody who understands something about aviation, please contact us. It's free and it's absolutely confidential. If you speak to, to one of the Mayday peers, we do not report to your company. We do not report to CAA. We do not report to your AME. We don't report to your spouse. And although we did get a very nice offer from Uncle Vlad, we don't report to the KGB. So with that said, let's move on to why do we need to pre-flight the human? And there we go. Humans make mistakes, like I just did. Mistakes don't always have such easily recovered from consequences. In aviation, mistakes can be serious, even fatal. And we want to catch our mistakes as soon as possible to minimize those consequences. We also want to try and minimize the number of mistakes that we might make. And realistically, we know that we cannot stop or prevent all mistakes. And we need to understand ourselves to get better at this. I'm sure everybody's heard the saying that the most dangerous part of a vehicle is the nut at the controls or the nut at the wheel. Part of the problem that we have is that humans really are not good at self-recognition or self-awareness. And we often disregard just how much we are affected by physical or emotional distractions. So that being said, when do we need to look at this? And I would argue that the, most imp the more important or the more challenging the flight is, for whatever the reason, the earlier you need to start thinking about it. Because the idea is not to make a go, no-go decision as late as possible. It's rather to ensure that you've got a viable alternative as early as possible. Because somehow we believe that once a decision has been made, it can't be changed. And that really isn't true. So the first part of your human pre-flight should be before you even travel to the airport that you're departing from. Again, reassess when you have arrived and when you've completed your pre-flight. You need to remember that things change. And I'm sure that you're going to hear from Lauren about just how changeable the weather is. But if you hear that the weather has changed or if, if there's new information available, perhaps the facilities at the destination are not quite what you thought, or there's no fuel available. It's time to reassess. And most importantly, if you realize that you've missed something, for two reasons. First of all, you missed something, so you need to go back and check that you've actually completed whatever you missed. But sometimes you get a bit jarred, a bit startled by the fact that you've actually missed something. And that can have its own repercussions. How do we do this? Well, we're pilots, so we use checklists because that's just what pilots do. And I'm sure those more experienced among you and those that have attended some of our previous webinars will recognize the, the I'm safe checklist and the PAVE checklist. We've also spoken before about having personal minimums, and that's also something that needs to be checked. But the other wrinkle is remember your passengers in these checklists 
and I'll talk about that when we go through the, the checklists. So I'm safe. I'm not going to go through in as much detail as we went through in, in August. Uh, for those who are really interested, please have a look at the recording from August. But you can see that the branding has been taken over by the COVID police and they're issuing masks with the I'm safe uh, name. We're going to keep it as the aviation version. Illness. That's a fairly obvious one. If you're not well, you probably shouldn't be flying. Where this needs to be extended is if you're carrying passengers, especially if you're carrying children. Upper respiratory tract infections are not great and they can lead to real pain and real distress. So that's a very good reason for delaying or canceling or coming up with an alternative. Medication, remember, there is no substitute for making sure that whatever you're taking or whatever you think you need to take is okay for aviating. And there is no substitute to discussing that with your AME. It's also important to remember to discuss potential interactions if you're taking more than one medication. And sometimes something as bizarre as grapefruit can change medication uptake. So it's a good idea to be an informed patient if you are taking anything. A good start, uh, AOPA in the US has got a very good list of, of medicines. You'll need the generic name, not the, the brand name though. Just remember that it's not the same as the South African medications that are permitted, but it's a good place to start to figure out whether there's anything problematic. Just a reminder as well, uh, hopefully everybody is uh, up to speed with all of their vaccinations, but vaccinations can be grounding for two to three days. And that's not just a COVID vaccination, that's any of the others as well. Stress, all of the usual forms, um, loss of job, financial, emotional, all of these things are potentially problematic. You need to be honest with yourself about how badly they affect you. And small mistakes that you pick up before they become large mistakes are often an indicator that you might be a bit more stressed and a bit more distracted than you think you are. Alcohol, I hope everybody remembers that the legal requirement is eight hours bottle to throttle. 12 hours is recommended after light consumption. And a reminder that flying with a hangover is actually more debilitating according to US Air Force studies than flying while actually under the influence of alcohol. Recreational pharmaceuticals really should not be entering into any conversation about flying. Fatigue, you need to be realistic about this. Most of us are not up to a full day and then hopping into the cockpit and flying somewhere for three or four hours. Plan carefully. And this is also something that's going to be a bit different if you're flying in a multi-crew environment. The standard E emotion, we've spoken about the, the stress, but be careful of shock, surprise, grief, loss, dread. Happy emotions can also be distracting. Probably not a great idea to fly just before a wedding, especially if you're one of the people getting married. Think carefully about your level of distraction. Eating, that's the second E in I'm safe, the, the silent one. Two things to be careful of from a food point of view, beware of the carb coma. Not all of us suffer from it, but some do. And remember that not eating is also not really an option. Uh, the the blood, low blood sugar level can make people irritated and hangry. And that's not really what you want to be when flying. And those of us with cheap made in Taiwan bladders also have to worry about 
dehydration because we are worried about having to stop somewhere en route for a comfort break. And that's not really that possible. I've got on there as well, scuba considerations. A lot of South Africans are scuba divers and there are some very real considerations if you are going to fly after you have been diving, especially if it's been necessary to have a controlled ascent. And that's true whether you're flying on a pressurized aircraft or an unpressurized aircraft. Please be very aware of that sort of thing. It's important to remember that your biggest challenge as a pilot may happen during your next hour. You need to be ready to deal with it and you need to be honest about your readiness. This is not something that you can really know absolutely, but if you haven't eaten properly, if you are fatigued and stressed, the chances are not good that you will deal with it as well as you normally would. The second checklist is PAVE, and you'll have to excuse the, the visual dad joke. The kids bet me that I wouldn't, so of course it's in. Um, and for those who like music, yes, it's just another brick in the wall. The PAVE checklist, something that is quite heavily promoted by the FAA, and a lot of the health aspects of the pilot and passengers is covered by the I'm safe. So we're not going to go too much into those at this stage. Rather consider things like your currency, um, how recently you've flown that particular aircraft and what your experience is in that aircraft. If it's a trip that you've flown plenty of times before, that's a good thing. If the weather's not so great and you haven't flown that type in a year, something maybe to be a little bit cautious about. Aircraft, lots of things to talk about there. Caroline's going to cover most of the aircraft considerations, but at a minimum, ensuring that you've got enough fuel, making sure that your weight and balance is within limits. You're familiar with the aircraft. All of the documentation is on board. You've done your performance calculations where necessary, and you know that you've got enough runway for takeoff, enough runway for landing, enough runway at the alternate, and adequate climb and performance margins. It's also a good idea to check if there's been any recent maintenance. We're not talking about post-maintenance flights. I believe those should be approached very differently, and that's a topic for another day. The environment is the most difficult one for us to get an immediate handle on because the weather is very changeable and that's the largest part of the environment. Lauren will talk about the weather. So I'm just going to mention this is where the personal minimums come in. Make your pre-flight call based on your personal minimums and stick to those minimums. At all times, you're very free to increase your personal minimums but you should only decrease them after very careful consideration. And you should never do that for a specific flight. Also a very good idea, make sure that you check your NOTAMs and make sure that the facilities are what you are expecting. Especially with everything that's happened over the last two years, many fields do not have fuel. Many fields have got different hours if they're controlled and the number of functional nav aids varies from hour to hour. So good idea to do that. External pressures are probably the most insidious and probably the most challenging to deal with from a personal point of view. And this is where the most important advice I can give is manage expectations of your passengers, of the people that you're going to meet, General aviation is not the airlines. Even if you're flying a wonderful machine that has full de-ice and anti-ice, multi-engine, certified for everything, there are going to be times when it's not a good idea to make that flight. 
always build in extra time and make sure that you've got good alternatives. That doesn't just mean good alternative destinations or en route or departure alternatives. It means good alternatives to the flight. Make sure you've got a viable plan for if you have to cancel or divert. Who do you need to tell that you're going to do that? And remember, it's always a hurry to be, it's always a mistake to be in a hurry around a machine. There you go. Human factors again. Doesn't matter whether it's an aircraft, a car, or a computer. These things sense your impatience and treat you accordingly. So what are the takeaways for tonight? The pre-flight starts long before you reach the aircraft and you need to make sure that the crew, the passengers and yourself are properly pre-flighted. Optionality is the most important thing that you can possibly give yourself. Give yourself extra time and extra fuel if possible. If people have an expectation that you are going to be there at 9.03, then you're setting yourself up for a bad time. Enjoy the extra time. We're not trying to do this so that we don't get extra time in the logbook. Reframing is a very important skill as well. And it's not, oh dear, this is really bad. We're going to have to divert. It's time to see whether I really am as good at planning as I thought I was. One of my first instructors always said, the most important question you can ask yourself is, if I don't do this, how much difference will it make when I'm looking back at this in a year's time? And this just talks to giving yourself options. The less pressure you're under, the more realistic your decisions are going to be. And finally, second opinions are worth gold. Have a friend or an instructor or a mentor that you can phone and discuss this sort of thing with. It's amazing how often bouncing your thoughts off somebody else lets you confidently make a decision. And that may be a go decision or it may be a no-go decision. But just verbalizing your thoughts is often all that's necessary to crystallize the idea. So hopefully there's been something here that you can take away and you can use. And I'm just going to close with the Mayday contact details again. So please remember, if you do need us, call us. We are there. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you so much, Ari. Um, I always enjoy listening to you and your presentation. You've got um, such a calm demeanor. I love it. And um, there were just a few things that I took from your presentation. I love them. Um, we've got to pre-flight the human. I think that's, that's absolutely amazing. And then you, you talk about the nut at the wheel and self-recognition and awareness. And I think that goes for so many things in life. And it's just about being sensible and listening to your body, right? And, um, and then um, the one thing that I really had a quiet chuckle with with myself, and um, I've got three kids, um, and um, they never learn. You know, they, they mustn't challenge us to anything and say, don't do these things. And then, um, yeah, it's just another brick in the wall, no? <laughs> I see, that, I see that there is one, one question there, carb coma, that, that somebody hasn't heard of. Um, if you have a meal that's heavy in carbs, it often makes you sleepy afterwards. Um, and that's just a fact of the carbohydrate metabolism and, and part of your digestion. Some people are more affected than others. Um, so it's good to know what your personal... Uh, impact is, but it's going to be something to consider if you fly somewhere for a for a nice breakfast or a nice lunch, and then you're going to fly back. Um, probably a good idea not to eat as much as you would like to. 
Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Ari. And then, um, yeah, um, our next speaker is, is Lauren Smith. And coincidentally, we share a birthday, which happened uh, a few days ago. And Quibus is two days before us. So obviously, uh, Spicians are, are quite good people, hey? because um, this webinar is going really well. But um, Lauren, I heard somebody talking about a post-birthday flight for the two of us at Aero. So I heard something like that. Um, I think we must just have a quiet word with Quervis to make that happen. <laughs> but um, Lauren, um, happy birthday for the other day. And on that note, over to you. Thank you so much, Neil. And thank you to Area South Africa for, again, this opportunity to continue the, comp the campaign with you guys uh, this year. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, Neil, if I can just get a yes or nay, if you can see it. Yep, all good. Okay. So like Neil has said, everyone, good evening. Um, I've been part of this for a couple of years now, and oh, believe me, every single time I learn something new, and I'm really excited to share um, this next hour with you guys. So I'd like to start off with a short clip, and um, I'd like you to think in terms of what would you have done differently, and what would have your pre-human check have been? so that you wouldn't be in a similar situation. Runway 35, clear for takeoff. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported eight kilometer visibility looks more like three and you can't judge the height of the cloud. Your altimeter says you're at 1,500 feet, but your man- Sorry guys, mistakes. Runway 35, clear for takeoff. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported 8 kilometer visibility looks more like 3 and you can't judge the height of the cloud. Your altimeter says you're at 1,500 feet, but your map tells you there's local terrain as high as 1,200 feet. There might even be a tower nearby because you're not sure just how far off course you are. But you've flown into worse weather than this, so you press on. You find yourself unconsciously easing back just a bit on the controls to clear those non-too-imaginary towers. With no warning, you're in the soup. You peer so hard into the milky white mist that your eyes hurt. You fight the feeling in your stomach. You swallow, only to find your mouth dry. Now you realize you should have waited for better weather. The meeting was important, but not that important. Somewhere a voice is saying, you should have turned back. You now have 178 seconds to live. Your aircraft feels on an even keel, but your compass turns slowly. You push your rudder pedal and add pressure to the controls to stop the turn. But this feels unnatural, so you quickly return the controls to their original position. That feels better. But now your compass is turning a little faster and your airspeed is increasing slightly. You scan your instrument panel for help, but you don't find any. It all looks unfamiliar. You're sure this is just a bad spot. You'll break out in a few minutes. But you don't have a few minutes. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and are shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1,200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The engine is into the red, and the airspeed's almost there too. You have 45 seconds to live. Now you're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves that airspeed indicator deep into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the aircraft. You have 10 seconds to live. 
Suddenly, you see the ground. The trees rush up at you. You can see the horizon if you turn your head far enough, but it's at an unusual angle. You're almost inverted. You open your mouth to scream. Now, that's not to scare anyone. Um, but um, it is definitely important to realize that it's not only, sorry guys, I don't know how to get these things away from my screen. I don't understand why. It's, hope you guys don't mind it, sorry for that, but um, it's all about your pre-fright preparation. Um, that video is a very good emphasis on that it's not only just an hour, you don't, you, know, you might have only two seconds to think um, of something. And that is also how quickly the environment changes around you. So um, to get to the pre-flight preparations, there's a lot that you guys have to do. We all understand that. Um, as Ari has already indicated that you guys have checklists. So I'd like to suggest something that you guys can include um, with your mate briefings is, is um, how to structure them and where to find them. So the parameters that um, one should uh, look for or at least consider um, for, for, um, at first um, would be your general forecast of your winds, your temperature, and then your route, on route weather, especially um, in your in-between of your takeoff and landing, and then associated turbulence and icing. So this is just a little flow diagram in terms of how to look at your own little crystal ball. So it's all about location. Where's your location of your takeoff? And then where's your location of your landing? Then your first question um, suggestively would be to locate where your high pressures are and your low pressures are that are affecting South Africa for that day. Um, that you can find in your synaptic pressure analysis map. Also then to identify any cold fronts and coastal low pressures. And that you can see on a satellite imagery and that's also available on the aviation website. After you've got now a sense of what effects is at play. So for example, if you're expecting now a cold front uh, to make landfall on the way to Cape Town uh, from Durban, for example, there's a lot of other things that are in play because now you know if the cold front is really close to Cape Town, maybe making landfall in three hours, there's definitely a coastal low somewhere. So this coastal low is in situated perhaps between PE and Durban, if not already at Durban. And if you're taking off at Durban, now this coastal low is either bringing in some cold air circulation, so it's cold and gusty winds coming in as it um, approaches. It's also bringing in low cloud, it's stable conditions. What does this low cloud mean for you guys? It means that you're either going to be waiting for departure, you're going to go into IMC conditions, and those type of things. And that comes down, down to the next and third point that I'm trying to make is now what is your hazards now associated with these circulations at your takeoff and landing as well as your in-between. As I've said, low cloud, precipitation, am I gonna get drizzle? Drizzle um, decreases your visibility a lot more than showers. Your showers are bigger warm water droplets. So they are, spread out a lot more. So therefore your visibility is a lot better um, in a shower condition than drizzle. Especially when it starts mixing with a misty condition, you know, radiation fog after a really hot day and then everything like starts to steam. Um, then another um, suggestion was what type of clouds are in your vicinity, um, especially before or after your um, plan your flight, your, your um, takeoff. So if you're in the morning and you're getting up and you've got an afternoon flight and you're already seeing Castellanus in the sky, then you already know this atmosphere is quite unstable today. What are my timings? 
It's October. Um, it's a beautiful Kavok morning, no, even no cloud out. Here by nine o'clock, the Castellanos start to develop. You've got your queues, then you've got your towering queues already here by two o'clock, and you can time it. Day on three o'clock, four o'clock, you have your thunder showers. So it's those type of thinking that you kind of now need to start playing with and um, get your timing. And of course, the South African Weather Service is always there to help you, just a phone call away with such types of um, questions. Then there's other things to consider when you're looking, especially at your synaptic pressure map, for example, is you could consider looking at regions that could be susceptible to strong surface winds. Um, and this is indicative by a tight pressure gradient, especially between a low and a high pressure. For example, if you have your lows um, over your western parts of your country and your high dominating over Gauteng, then you get that strong pressure gradient, gradient over the central parts of the interior. So if you do go do cross country, those strong winds will then relay into turbulence. So where do you get all this information? Um, it's then from two places. For now, I know that there's multiple places, multiple tools out there, which are all great. Some of them in, even integrate into your personal aviation tools. Um, these are just a quick two. Um, Windy TV, um, it's a great tool because you can use it as a multi-model um, or an ensemble, trying to get an average of what's happening of the day because it displays four different models. Um, and as well satellite, and then the aviation website as well, which I'm going to quickly run through for those that are very new to it. So after registration, which is free, you get a forecast tab, you'll be able to see your color coded tabs. And if you hover over the highlighted um, in color um, codes, it will actually decode it for you. You can find your takeoff data, which helps with pressure, your temperature, and Q and H for the day, sorry, and uh, wind direction and speed, your warnings as well. And then you also get your synoptic analysis map here from the aero sport map, as well as your cloud cover, your percentages of your convective cloud for the day, spot graph map that gives you a vertical cross section of the atmosphere at that coordinate. Um, overlaid with winds as well as relative humidity. So you can kind of gauge cloud bases and your type of clouds that are expected. Also, we have a, uh, sorry, a um, yes, thunderstorm um, probability map. Also your observations, as I've said, your metals, your satellites, as well as radar and a very cool tab of the webcams, which actually is very helpful, especially in those mornings that you fly up north uh, to the northern escarpment there, by Mulanga going to Nile Spread, for example, you can always check that low cloud, how it just stays there. And sometimes it's good to be able to see the, the timing of as it lifts. Then you also get your SIG weather. Um, if you click on the most recent, it will give you the most recent updated um, hourly maps. You also get your wind maps um, that also help you with um, figuring out your turbulence as well as your um, winds at your flight level. And that's all from my side. Um, thank you again so much for your time. And any questions are welcome. And there are our contact details for the various offices, the regional offices of, of South Africa. Thank you once again. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Lauren. And um, yeah, just again, thank you so much for making the time. Um, I know that you, you're busy with your master's thesis and um, that is all consuming. So we are very, very appreciative. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those websites. They're wonderful tools. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker for the night is, um, and before we get to that, um, if you do have any questions, please just again, a reminder to put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of, of your screen, and we will get to that now. now. Um, but yeah, to end tonight is, is Caroline Cole, who always brings a, a fresh approach to her presentations and is so detailed in her approach.
approach. Caroline, did you get that? Anneli yes. told me I was allowed <laughs> one aeronautical joke. And there it is. That's my take on that. But on that note, over to you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so what I want to be talking about this evening is uh, the unexpected pre-flight. Um, you know, many of us are used to doing pre-flights. Um, it becomes quite a routine thing. Um, but I'd like us to consider for a change the unexpected things. So inadequate pre-flight inspections. Uh, the consequences of inadequate pre-flight inspections are well known. Um, it's a probable cause of many fatal accidents. Really simple stuff that could have been prevented with a proper pre-flight. Um, most common direct causes of these types of accidents, fuel contamination, usually with water, um, which then tends to lead to a power loss after takeoff and a, a resultant stall spin situation. Um, then improperly latched baggage doors. This happens frequently as well. Pito covers control locks and foam air intake plugs left in place, oil filler or fuel tank caps that are unsecured, and then failure to remove chocks or ladders. These simple things which are often form the basis of pre-flight inspections is really yeah, the simplest things that often cause the most uh, fatal accidents and stuff that we learn from an early time uh, in our pilot training. So the key to a good pre-flight is understanding what you are checking and why you are checking it. So you need to develop a sense of what is normal, what is abnormal, what is airworthy, and what is not. Not always easy. Um, and that's where I also agree with Ari, is have a mentor. You don't need to be a qualified maintenance person, but have somebody that you can talk to if you are not sure um, whether this is flyable or not flyable or abnormal. So what are you checking? So here, I just want to highlight a few things that we pick up quite frequently in instruction um, where people do the action, but don't necessarily know what they are actually checking. So test the controls. So very often we get people turning the ailerons, uh, pulling the controls back to check the elevator, but they don't really know what they're checking. So you want to check that the control surface reacts correctly to the control input. So in other words, if you are turning your control column to the right, that the right aileron goes up, and to the left, the left aileron goes up. By doing this, we are actually checking the correct um, rigging of that airplane. So particularly if your airplane um, has been to maintenance, um, definitely check this. Uh, I get my students to check this all the time, and I get them to tell me what is the normal reaction of this. Similarly, your elevator as well, um, pulling your controls backwards should bring your elevator up and bringing your controls forward should bring your elevator down. Um, then your magnetos. So when we are looking at the magnetos or checking the magnetos, we're checking that the magneto grounding wires are still connected. So if they are not connected, then you would see that there is no drop in RPM at all. So we're looking for a drop, not an excessive drop within your aircraft limits, um, but there needs to be a drop. Pito tube, simple one. Check for blockage, but besides the blockage, check for security. Sometimes these pito tubes tend to wear themselves loose and it could come loose in flight. So 
be aware that a blockage will actually affect um, your airspeed indicator. So as we say, airspeed is life. So if you are not picking up any um, airspeed, then very likely you have a pitot blockage. Um, the static port. So here we also want to check for blockages. Um, blockage of the static port you will affect the following instruments. So your airspeed indicator as well, which relies on both the pitot and the static um, air pressures, your altimeter, and your vertical speed indicator. So three very critical instruments um, for our flight. So these little holes, we want to make sure that these are kept clear at all times. Then I always suggest don't be a robot. Don't just do your pre-flight as if you were a robot. Often when the pre-flight is done, um, it tends to be done as a predetermined routine with expected results. Instead, as a pilot, you should rather try to become a detective and look for the unexpected things. So typical unexpected things. Nature is one of those very unexpected things, just like the weather. Look for eyes staring back at you. These are all real scenarios. In this particular case, somebody found a small green tree frog climbing out of the fairing between the wing strut and the fuselage of a Cessna 172. Nobody knew how many flights this poor green tree frog had actually taken in that aeroplane. Engine cowling flaps. So all very nice. You did your pre-flight. You looked inside the engine compartment, but did you close it up again? This frequently happens. People forget to close it up again. The plugs. You remove the plugs, but do you ever count your plugs? And even better, do you ever look inside the air intakes? Um, this was actually uh, taken from an AMO. Uh, where the plug was actually found in the air intake. So it was left there and it got sucked into the air intake. So as I say, it's not just about removing them, count them, make sure you have them all, and then look inside the air intakes. Um, fairings. So I'm not sure if you can really see this, but um, there's actually a crack on this fairing. So I like to touch touch the aeroplane, because if you put your hands on it, you can often pick up something that you don't necessarily see with your eyes. So this particular one I actually picked up by touching it. Um, I noticed the crack on the fairing, and then it brought me to looking a little bit closer, and this is what I found underneath. So very unlikely um, that I would have spotted this if I actually hadn't, um, well, my suspicions hadn't been drawn to that crack on the top. So try and get your hands dirty, should I say, um, and touch your aeroplane. Chafing. So keep your eyes out for any sort of chafing or damaged pipes, tubing, or other components. So this might not have been serious immediately because it was just a baffle plate cutting through um, a bit of rubber, but if this gets left unnoticed, this could eventually become quite a serious problem. So we don't want to leave things like that. Um, seats. So how sure are you that the seat is secure and won't slide back on takeoff? Um, so often, uh, you know, we, we sort of adjust the seat position, particularly if you're a person who does hire and fly, um, and it's not your own aeroplane, and you frequently move the seat, um, make sure that you hear the click. Um, I am never convinced that my seat is secure until I hear a positive click. Um, a seat sliding back on takeoff can be exceptionally dangerous. Um, you could end up, uh, because the, the weight, the center of gravity would actually move backwards if your seat, uh, if, if yours or your passenger seat, that's another point, is also consider your passenger seats. Make sure that your passenger seats are secure as well. Um, so it could actually take you that far back, but you couldn't reach the controls. 
or it can also shift the center of gravity. So that's a very serious one. Make sure it's properly done. The underbelly. Um, so a lot of people sort of walk around the airplane, but very few actually look underneath the airplane. So the best vantage point is actually to stand behind the airplane and um, age permitting, lower yourself uh, to your knees. And from the back of the airplane, you'll actually have a pretty good view of the whole underbelly of the, um, of the airplane. So look out for any loose plates, rivets, or missing screws, something very often um, overlooked. Tools, especially if you've been working on your airplane or if your airplane has been in at maintenance, often tools are left either in the engine compartment or, for example, on the windshield. That's a very common place where screwdrivers get left is on the windshield. Um, in this case, the uh, screwdriver was actually left on the windshield um, and it ended up shearing the propeller off um, because nobody noticed that that screwdriver was on the windshield. So if you're working on your airplane yourself, account for all your tools. So good, good workmanship. Put your tools back where you got them. Um, tow bars. And no, you won't necessarily hear this which is why this has happened countless times. It doesn't mean you will hear it. Um, very often, um, people have actually taken off with the tow bar still attached because you pull the aircraft out, you complete the pre-flight, but you forget the tow bar. Okay, it's not so funny sometimes. Um, so aircraft that are in frequent use, that is actually where we have the greatest risk of inadequate pre-flights because especially in a school environment or if you are flying your airplane really regularly then you are assuming that because you flew it yesterday that everything is in working order or somebody flew it in the last 15 minutes it must be working just fine so the fact is that they have uh, the fact that somebody or yourself has recently flown, seems in itself to prove the readiness to fly again. This is not necessarily the case. The airplane is not ready to fly until you have pre-flighted it again. So think again. Right, if anybody has any questions or you want to brush up your skills, you are welcome to contact me on the details below. And that's all from me, Neil. Thank you so much, Caroline. As always, that was brilliant. Uh, I learned a lot just listening to you. So thanks again for all of your efforts in putting that together. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it as well. Thanks, Caroline. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, now we're gonna get to our Q&A um, section of the event. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Quibus, who has been curating the questions that have been coming through. So, Quibus, over to you. Hi, uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks. Good evening, everybody, and uh, well done, presenters. Uh, that was great stuff. Thank you so much. Very few questions, but some very interesting ones uh, from Dion Kricher. Um, he's a 70 something PPL, but with an instrument rating. So, that's a medal already. I fly mostly long uh, country flights. Uh, where there's a problem cross country flights, of course, my instrument ladies is in order to make my flight safer. Yes, of course. Nothing else. Don't fly commercially. So now CA has changed the rules such that I need a class, and I take it as a class one medical for a PPL with an IR. To me, to start with, it makes zero sense. But anyway, at my age, this might be a problem. So no other country requires this. Not okay, no FA. The FA is irrelevant, but AK okay is very relevant. So if now you, you have to fly VFR, which reads cut running, yes, I suppose so you can put it that way. My safety factor just became a whole lot lower and in fact your safety risk became high in the sense that you won't be doing scud running, but you do, don't have an eye for rating. Can, anyone be, can anything be done to dissuade them from implementing this? Um, do you want the best answer I have? We'll ask the panel as well. <clears throat> I don't know. I'll have to refer that to Alpa. We, we, we've got uh, Margie for you, and she works directly with the medical board. I'm going to see her tomorrow with safety stuff. So we'll try and find out. 
And if you could only if you can send us your email address via Anli or somewhere, then we will get back to you. Anybody from the panel, perhaps that can help me out here. I I'm not aware of this, but it certainly doesn't make any sense. Okay, I thought so. Yeah, um, we'll get to that one, Dion. Anneli, please, if, if if you could relay that, and Dion, if you can send an email, then I think it's the best way to do it. It certainly doesn't make any sense. Uh, from Anakin Webb, uh, would you be interested in being involved in Air Scouts, group associated with Scouts? Air Scouts deals with all things aviation, and I'm uh, part of the fourth Air Scouts group in Mohill Benoni. Anakin, for sure, anytime. I mean, anything that, that's interested in aviation is really a plus. If you're uh, involved or um, interested in aviation safety, that's a plus plus. So I can also ask the question, would you like to be involved with us as well, with the safety or safety first aviatic? So for sure. And uh, um, a panel or not panel and presenters, let's take note of that. And uh, thanks. Um, and and Anakin would definitely take that up. Yeah. Then Dion had a second question. Uh, the request for the weather, the weather lady, that is Lauren. Sorry, my dog is pissing me. Just, um, please, 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 can the weather radars be fixed, especially the one in George, because they never work, and the weather radar picks an extremely important to us, particularly across country flights. Um, I'll hand over to Lauren. Um, I'm just not sure, is this a weather services uh, issue or whether it's an AXA issue? Lauren, you will know. Hi, yes. Um, sorry, I had to move uh, my location a bit. Um, yeah, regarding the, the radars, um, we don't have one anymore at George, like it's completely taken down. Um, it's a big blind spot for us as well, especially when those thunder showers come over the interior um, into George. So um, satellites and um, is your best bet for, for those areas. And um, the South African Weather Service is also actually hosting an aviation information session on the 2nd of March. And we're gonna have actually a, a speaker regarding uh, the radar and um, that. So it is on the Twitter page, the invitation it's open, it's free. Um, so if you are interested in a lot more information regarding that, please uh, go and register and join us then for that next week. Uh, Wednesday. Um, sorry, I can't give you more information. Um, it is um, partly maintenance and um, infrastructure uh, things that, um, you know, is unfortunately the cause to the lack of availability. All right, thanks, uh, weather lady. <laughs> I like that. Thanks, Lauren. So, uh, Dion, please. Um, the other questions, send us an email. So, too, I forgot to say, Anakin Webb, uh, you know how to get hold of Anneli or some of us, and, and we will certainly will try and get together. Then the scouts here in Pretoria as well help them to wash the aircraft at the museum at uh, Swarkop. So, just something else, I think the um, Anneli, um, Carolina, I think you also noticed. Carl, thanks so much for the inputs about the controls and the fuel selector with uh, especially having aircraft on, on the fuel selectors. I uh, really appreciate that. And I see uh, Caroline's also typing answers there for you guys. Thanks so much, Neil. That's that's all I have uh, on the question part. Thanks, Quibus. There might not have been too many quick questions, but yo, there was a lot of chat happening. And um, it's mm. always so good on these webinars. I just love the fact that people get involved and feel like they can ask the questions to, to, the, to our panelists. Um, and then just to, to end tonight, just um, to all our speakers once again, uh, thank you for all your efforts in preparing for tonight. And really, it's about the purpose of keeping you all safe by being better prepared and doing it with some introspection. So look into yourself, listen to your body, listen to those signs that you see. And then to all of our delegates, thank you so much for joining. And if you haven't attended our previous webinars, and tonight was your first, please head to aerosouthafrica.com, aerosouthafrica.com to view all of our past webinars. And um, then I know Anneli's um, sending me messages here, fast and furious, just to remind you, you need to book your exhibition space at Aero, um, 7th to 9th of July this year. It's going to be great. We're going to be together and um, it's going to be a great event for the, for the broader aeronautical industry. So from my side and the rest of the crew, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Take care.